Welcome to the Angle Expert Access Series. Today, we're speaking to Brian Simmers, the CFO and VP of Health Informatics and Corporate Development at Providence Healthcare. Brian's a business leader and entrepreneur who's passionate about culture and diversity, is a champion of innovation, and spends a lot of his time shaping organizational strategy. Today, we're talking to Brian about leadership, technology, and organizational change in the nonprofit world. Brian, welcome. And thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. So before we get into the questions, can you just take a minute to walk me through your background? Sure. Um, well, I, I started out as a, as a humble accountant, um, did my article in, at uh, KPMG, um, but was there during the time of the dot-com, uh, the boom, and and kind of seeing companies around us uh, that we were working with going public. And so got kind of enamored with that that, that whole uh, technology stream, those technology companies, got involved with them, helped them go public, and, and eventually left um, to go work for one of them. And uh, Kind of you know got into that private uh, stream of things very early um you know was part of a number of companies that uh, you know we we were successful um some weren't um you know we worked in the wireless business for quite a while uh, so kind of built and sold and uh, acquired companies and uh you know really saw myself as a true you know entrepreneur uh you know private business would never work in the public sector ever um, and then, and then got a phone call from a, a very, you know, different recruiter who kind of positioned this opportunity with the safety authority as a, a data play. And, and the idea was, could you predictively, um, you know, uh, assess uh, different uh, pieces of equipment that are being kind of constructed or serviced and find out which ones are the more likely to have an issue and then send people to only those. So it was really, it was an AI uh, play within a, the safety authority, which, you know, you kind of think is a bit, you know, stayed and, and, and you know, not a user of technology. But uh, so I was able to kind of come from a startup into a government organization and kind of renovate from the inside out their technology processes and stuff like that, uh, build some products, um, change the way they worked, and, uh, and then took this opportunity to, to really be part of this amazing kind of 18 acre you know, $2.1 billion hospital, uh, you know, going to be the most technologically advanced hospital in Canada. So saw an opportunity again to take kind of the, the background the experience I had in technology, um, you know, passionate about, you know, BC, uh, born in BC, kind of want to see this as an asset for, for the province and for everyone for years, years to come. Wow. You've been a busy guy. So let's transition a little bit to Providence Healthcare. So tell me a bit about Providence Healthcare and your role there. Sure. Yeah. So well, Providence, as I mentioned, we run St. Paul's Hospital, the current one. Uh, we run Mount St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, we have Holy Family Hospital. And then we have a number of long-term care facilities. We run all the, the dialysis units for the province. And we, we're home to a number of, of, of provincial centers, uh, cardiac center, uh, HIV AIDS, uh, the renal center, things like that. Um, we're a Catholic healthcare organization. We're a not-for-profit society, um, and we're affiliated with Vancouver Coastal Health. Wow. Okay, um, so you. Yeah. Okay, so you went from a more entrepreneurial environment uh, to the public sector. Did the former help you in any way in your current role, and how? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, obviously, you got to pick the right place, but I've definitely been uh, supported and encouraged to continue to think the same way that I did in those in those startups. Uh, you know, in my mind, uh, working in a startup is about constraints and, and creative solution uh, solutioning. So, uh, when you you're in the public sector, you have different constraints. Uh, you have a lot of rules. You have a lot of regulations. Um, but maybe you have more funding in a way and you have you know, more leverage and, and and size so so it's really about optimizing solutions um and and being creative and and um kind of seeing what's possible okay. uh, and, and and just pushing so all right so so tell me what value does a cfo bring to the organization today versus in the past well lots of value of course um, and I, I think uh, yeah, we're being called on to be um, strategic business partners. Um, you know, yes, of course, there's the numbers and we'll have to account for something down the road. But how do we how do we structure things? How do we get into things? How do we leverage things? Um, and I think there's actually a lot of sales. There's a lot of especially in a not for profit environment. You're fighting for money. You're negotiating. You're you're you know, leveraging. And, and, and I think you have to be able to to state your case, um, make your arguments, um, and really pursue all sources of funding. 
uh, in order to be able to then turn around to your business plan and then fill it and, and, and execute on it. Excellent. So shifting gears a little bit. So how has technology changed the role of finance inside of an organization? Um, I think, I mean, it's just the technology speed uh, it generally, I think, has raised expectations. You know, I remember vendors that used to complain about not getting paid in a month and kind of now they complain they're not paid in you know a couple of days a week, um, especially contractors, because we all see the speed. We can do it all online. And what do you mean you have to write a check? Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I think I think it's, it's just kind of raised expectations. Um, you know, I think there's more interest in okay, those are the numbers, but what's behind them and how do they link to operational metrics? Like how, how, what is the relationship between the number of say, you know, people that visited the emergency department and the amount of overtime that was booked into that financial period. So it's kind of sinking too. There's a you know financial period, but then there's a, there's a natural operational period and those tend to be a little different. So there's lots of challenges there uh, just around getting those pieces of data together, but, but just a hunger for data, I think is really um, what I see kind of the, the change being, um, there's a recognition. I think that that finance is important and that having good information is important and there's a, um, more willingness to invest in this area. Okay. So you may have sort of answered this, but so finance departments are known for looking back in time at historical information and trends. Um, so how do today's finance leaders help to drive the business forward? Um, I think they, they, uh, so. Obviously, that that historical analysis is what gives you kind of the insights and um, learnings that you can apply to future um, things that are coming. Um, I think the biggest thing is to to really question the allocation of resources and how are those resources being put to work to achieve the strategic goals of the organization. Uh, this is this could be in the form of actually reallocating budget, focusing with any new budget but really aligning the budgeting process to the, the strategic planning process and really you know, lo- working lockstep with those leaders to, so that the money is there, right? If we say this is important, we have to achieve it. The money has to be there. The support has to be there. The analytics have to be there. Um, so I think getting more active, getting more engaged in, in the business and what it's trying to or the organization, what it's trying to achieve. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit. So how does Providence Healthcare foster innovation? Yeah, I think we, we're fortunate that we have a 125-year um, history um, started by uh, the Sisters of Providence who were very innovative themselves. And so there's kind of this, the, the, the roots of the organization are about innovation, about um, not being afraid to challenge the status quo. Um, you know, it's about, uh, you know, focus, helping populations that are not served or that maybe there's, there's a taboo around serving, um, like the HIV AIDS, uh, when that was a thing, uh, we were the first to really step into that and say, we're willing to help, we're willing to to look, and there was a lot of fear um, there. So we have kind of, our, our pioneers really kind of gave us the, uh, you know, the the direction, they, they got us going the right way. Um, how we foster it is actually, you know, we really actually invested in this area. So we created something called Innovarium 360, which is an umbrella program to foster innovation in a number of places. So there's kind of the idea, hey, uh, what if we made this change? We could reduce the time it takes for a patient to get X done or Y done. Um, well, how do we help you with that? How could we expand that idea? Who, who would we need to talk to? So there's support there. Um, we have <clears throat> clinicians that have ideas. We have researchers. Obviously, we, we have a lot of research programs. Um, one of the buildings behind me is going to be dedicated to research, uh, wet labs and things like that. So there's translation. So that's our, our research institute. And then we have uh, Providence Healthcare Ventures, which is actually supporting the commercialization of ideas. Um, you know, could be, you know, support, access to data, access to resources, or even access to capital. So I think we've, we're trying to approach it as an ecosystem and, and an innovarium, as we like to call it. Oh, okay. And, and so how do you guys actually use data for decision making? Um, it's good. There's lots of, you know, the hospitals are full of data um, and there's lots of standardized metrics and benchmarking. So one of the ways we, we do use is we do, um, there's, there's benchmarks, there's Canadian wise benchmarks, there's regional benchmarks. So really to assess our performance is one of the, one of the ways and, um, you know, hopefully to assess the efficiency in which we deliver service. Like, are we, you know, uh, using the taxpayers dollars uh, wisely? Um, we also use data to make, uh, business case decisions. So, so is this, you know, um, co- common situation is is really looking at 
uh, investment in HR, and then what is the result? What is the outcome we're going to get? So, how can we measure that outcome? How do we then bring the business case back a year later and say, okay, did we achieve that that metric, that change in the number that we we thought? Um, another place we use it in our, our strategic plan. So we have strategic plan metrics that we track, so we know we're making progress on our, our strategic plan. Okay, great. Okay, so now I'm going to take a turn here. So the nonprofit sector has been through a lot these last few years, uh, from decreases in funding to staffing declines, a shift uh, to all things online, uh, which has led to a lot more technology, and now an economy fraught with uncertainty. How is this impacting NPO leaders? Um, and I, I know you're asking this question very broadly, but if I kind of bring it down to healthcare, um, healthcare has kind of had a little bit of a different experience with the, the financials. I mean, there's been a lot of funding kind of uh, added for COVID, a lot of programs added, a lot of supports. Um, so, you know, one of those challenges was just even coping with that and how do you put that money to work and how do you make sure you're doing it uh, to deliver value? Um, we certainly, you, you, the question about staffing, um, you know, the healthcare system itself has staffing challenges and, and just, just a demographic change, um, you know, the pressure, uh, those kinds of things have come to bear. Um, so I think um, that's, that's been a challenge to get creative about how do, we, how do we do things? How do we attract people? How do we retain them? Um, you know, what does flexibility mean? To, to, to a worker, uh, to a staff member, uh, it means something different depending on, on your role. So I think that's that's been something. The parts of your question, I'm sorry, maybe you could just uh, refresh me on that. Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, just all the, I, I think all the turmoil in the in the, in the the world today even, just yeah. like, how is it affecting people who are trying to lead in nonprofits? Yeah. Like leadership, right? Um, well, so, so turmoil-wise, I mean... Um, the, te the technology pieces, I think, are all good. Like the, the changes that have happened, the acceleration of investment in technology, you know, video capability, internet capability, those are all good things. Um, it's really like it's been hard on people. I think, um, you know, we, 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 we understand that we have to focus on people's wellness, um, you know, and, and that it's okay to say that you're not totally well and that you need a break. Um, so kind of shifting a little bit, some of the expectations, some of the, um, I'd say that there's a cultural shift that's, that's kind of underway, which was, you know, in the past, you suck it up, you know, you're tough, you can take it um, to, hey, you know, we really got to rethink what we're doing here because this isn't working and we're losing people. And, you know, if we want to bring people back in, like we need to create a healthy uh, workplace that doesn't, you don't need to spend an hour meditating afterwards to recover from, you know, ideally you are supported and nourished in the environment and that you leave better for it. So I think like uh, there's a shift, right? I think we all, you know, thought we could get through it with just a little extra hard work or just put our head down. And that kind of got us about a year in and then it was like, no, it's not enough. And we need to change the way we work. We, we think about people. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> Great point. So what characteristics and leadership styles would you say make for a good nonprofit leader in these changing times? Yeah, I think um, agility, um, you know, ability to kind of, you know, change, you know, sense the, the, the movement in the environment, sense where the opportunities are, and then, you know, position your organization to, to, to kind of take advantage of those to, to benefit from them. Um, you know, empathetic, uh, someone that's real that connects with the people, um, you know, um, yeah, and, and kind of seeks to understand what what the different generations are looking for. I mm -hmm. think it's another thing, like having genuine curiosity about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those are those would be some things I mentioned. Yeah. Okay. And so, what um, what kinds of organizational changes or changes are happening today? And what do you think needs to happen to both survive the current situation and, more importantly, come out of it in a better place? Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned the wellness. So there's definitely like there's a real focus on that. Um, also, violence prevention um, is, is another piece. Um, definitely seen an increase in, you know, violent incidents, um, people really kind of hitting their max as well. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, I mean, I, I look forward. So I mentioned, I mean, health has had a lot of investment. That investment is going to stop. And I think the the style of managing when you've kind of got more money than, you know, like than you've had in a long time, 
going back to a very scarce environment. I think the the change up is going to be, um, yeah, making the, the the challenge will be making that transition, um, and and those that can make it quicker and get back to that place of really understanding, being tight on things, kind of knowing exactly what what you really need to deliver uh, a service. I think will do better. Um, you know, we know inflation. We know you know there's a knock on effect and. And funding tends to be annual, and and I think a lot of nonprofits are probably concerned about their funding for next year, um, you know, for, for fiscal twenty three, because um, yeah, the full effects of inflation will be known and and felt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, um, so NP, NPOs had have had to adopt a lot of new technologies to enable them to move things online and to adapt during COVID. How is this impacting organizations? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd say somewhat positively, uh, you know, I think the, we saw, um, you know, two weeks into COVID, we had, um, zoom for everyone, which we didn't have the two weeks prior. Um, and we were able to drive our virtual visits up from almost zero to 40%. So I think there's a lot of positive changes. I think it showed us, um, what, what technology can do, um, and what, you know, things that we maybe previously thought were too hard to do or, or just take too long. Um, we, we now have references and we have examples to, well, we did that before, we could do that again. So I think that's it. Um, I think the challenge is that um, technology, we haven't kept up on technology. And so there is kind of a, a gap. And I think a lot of NPOs are in a position where they, they haven't been able to have the funding dedicated to IT spend. So their systems have aged out and they're either stuck in, you know, legacy unsupported systems, vulnerable to cyber threat. Um, and that is probably where they are, all are. Um, and, and and making that catching up is, is really challenging. So I think that's where, you know, we're trying to look at those core systems. What can we upgrade? How do we do this um, and, and have more of a, uh, you know, more data in a central place, less siloed data, so. And so if you put your you know CFO hat on and so specifically how have accounting has accounting been impacted by technology? Um you know I wish I could say that it's really been like changed. Um I mean like there's some small things like um you know we don't sign things physically anymore and that that sounds small but in healthcare it was really big like to not actually have to physically sign a stack of papers and checks and things like that. So we've gone a little more uh, process flow that way, um, more more digitization of, of documents, but we've got more to go. And, and I think these legacy systems have kind of actually held us back. Um, we're not able to take advantage of a lot of the, the new technologies and things that kind of automatically plug in. Um, so I think, I, I hope in the future we will, like that's that's kind of where we're going is, is it, it has to change. Um, it has to become more automated. Um, we'd love to see more robotic process automation happen. Um, and just more more digitization of all documents um, and and hopefully a real questioning kind of who uses this information? Do we need it? Does it have to be produced? Could it be automated? That kind of thinking. Yeah. So so you talked about a couple specific technologies like Zoom and other ones, but like what other ones do you think are really here to stay? And more importantly, how will these be managed by NPOs going forward? Um, You know, obviously a lot more technology and now you've got the oversight of technology inside of these organizations yeah um well i I think all of it's here to stay i don't think like like and again none of this technology is really revolutionary stuff it's just it's it's kind of basic tools that we need um you know and and not just to do our work but also to keep people um and attract new workers like if you have a choice you know do i go to the startup we're going to learn the latest language and the latest cloud platform or do i go to the mpo is still using you know, uh, on-premise old server-based technology, that's a consideration in terms of attracting talent. And I, I think my my main thought is actually that the the, the challenge we all, we have, uh, you know, is attracting that same scarce technical resource that, that Microsoft and Amazon are, are, are after as well. Um, we can't pay the same, we can't offer the same opportunities. So. So we're going to continue to be challenged by um, ability to attract t- talent internally that can manage this stuff for us. And we're going to become more and more reliant on vendors and, and outsourced providers to help us. So I think that's an opportunity in the market for the right people. Um, but it's also a challenge because they, they tend to feast 
on not for profits and yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Okay. Last question. So looking forward, what do you think are going to be the most challenging things for nonprofits to manage through? And what advice do you have for today's leaders? Yeah, I think it's the it's the talent, access to technology talent. Um, and um, my advice is that, um, you know, a lot of workers start with us. A lot of people take their first position with us. Um, and I think if, if we as leaders can recognize that we're going to be a training ground and structure our, our approach appropriately, we can actually really harness that. And we can be really good at training people. Um, and hopefully we, some of our culture, some of our mission, our purpose can rub off on these folks and they go to work in Amazon or Microsoft. And, you know, five years later, they get a little burnt out and they go, hmm, I really like to go back. I'd like to give back or, or maybe they've, they've started a family and they want a different work-life balance. And so so kind of being a great experience, being a great launch for these, these um, you know, technical folks, I think could be really powerful. And then, and then hopefully they'll come back or they'll give back. Yeah. Uh, they'll donate when they, they invent a new technology and, uh, you know, make it big. So awesome. That's fantastic. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate your insights and uh, all the information you've shared with us today. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. 